discuss about two light microscopy techniques which utilizes the phenomenon of fluorescence. The fluorescence microscopy and confocal microscopy, the extension of fluorescence optics. Now, fluorescence microscopy is a technique that util utilizes phenomenon of fluorescence to generate an image. Now, it is a extraordinarily sensitive method for detecting minute amount of material in a specimen as for any fluorescent material, the total intensity of fluorescence is proportional to the intensity of incidence light. Now, here in this technique, a sample is illuminated with light of a specific wavelength and we call it exciting wavelength or excitation wavelength, which is absorbed by the fluorophore or the fluorescent compound and which causes fluorescence. That is the light emitted by the fluorescence or emission wavelength or we call it fluorescence emission wavelength is at a different and longer wavelength than the illumination and mostly it is in visible region. This fluorescence emitted wavelength is detected through objective lens and finally, generates an image. It could be captured uh, on a, a digital device or it could be observed. Now, the, the illumination light is separated from weaker emitted fluorescence through use of optical filters, because as we know that the excitation wavelengths is a particular uh, characteristic of a particular of a compound. And so, you have to eliminate other wavelengths which may not be useful and optical filters are utilized. That is an addition in the optics here. We will be dealing with the optics later on. Now, one filter is placed between light source and condenser. What is the function of this? This particular filter allows only excitation wavelength almost near monochromatic and not any other wavelength in the fluorescence spectrum to be transmitted through the condenser lens. So, only excitation wavelength will pass through the uh, to the specimen uh, stage. The second filter uh, optical filter will be transmitting only fluorescence wavelength that is emission wavelength and it will not allow excitation wavelength uh, uh, to pass through and it is placed between objective and eye. So, what you have is two filters which has different filtration uh, which the filters the wavelength uh, different wavelengths one allows the excitation wavelength another does not allow excitation wavelength, but rather allows emission wavelength or fluorescence wavelength to pass through. Now, in absence of fluorescence or in absence of a fluorescent object the field is dark but in case of a fluorescent sample, the contrast is very strong with respect to background and you get excellent images of the specimen. Now, most fluorescence microscopes used in life sciences are epifluorescence microscopes. We will show you how the optics differs here. Now, this epifluorescence microscope means that excitation and observation of the fluorescence are from above, above the specimen that is from above the specimen. The main components of fluorescent microscope uh, uh, are as follows like we have already discussed uh, different components and some are common components, but there are certain additions here like we have seen in DIC or polarization microscopy. Likewise, here light source which is with excitation filter uh, and the dichroic. So, main components of fluorescent microscope are uh, a light source which is little different like we will discuss. The excitation filter that is first optical filter, the dichroic mirror which uh, is also called a beam splitter, objective lens, emission filter and a detector. Let us see each of them. Now, light source used in fluorescent microscopy are genon arc lamp or mercury vapor lamp with excitation filters and also lasers could be utilized. Lasers are mostly used for complex fluorescence microscopy technique like confocal microscopy which we are going to discuss later on.
Now, in fluorescence microscopy, halogen lamps are not used as they cannot provide intense near monochromatic illumination. So, to get near monochromatic illumination, you have to avoid halogen lamps. Non fluorescing slides, cover slips, and lenses are required for the analysis of weak fluorescence because if the slides cover slips itself fluoresce, then it will be very hard to, to analyze the weak fluorescence. So, you have to use to uh, see that those things are avoided. Now, let us get into uh, try to understand the optics of a fluorescence microscope. This is a very simple schematic of the optics of a fluorescence microscope. Now, here if you see a light source as we have discussed is different from halogen lamp it could be xenon arc lamp or mercury vapor lamp and here the light as it comes it is a near monochromatic or so what you have an optical filter here attached. This is the first optical filter and it says it will allow only a one wavelength only it will not allow anything. Uh, so, it will only allow one kind of uh, monochromatic wavelength to pass through. Now, this way this is then passed on to the condenser the condenser focuses the, the wavelength here onto the uh, specimen plane or object plane. Now, this the object is has to be fluorescent that is it should have a fluorescent substance which could be excited by this wavelength and so it could emit fluorescence. Now, as we go along if you can see that after the objective lens another optical filter has been placed and this optical filter is not allowing the excitation wavelength, but rather it is allowing only emission wavelength to pass through. So, this optical filter is different from optical filter number 1 and finally, you get uh, image in the image plane that is a very simple schematic, but like I said the epifluorescence microscopes are mostly used uh, uh, rather than a simple schematic. So, here is the schematic of epifluorescence microscope. So, what happens here you have a light source and this light source uh, uh, in confocal it will be laser as we will see. Now, there is an optical filter here at number 1 position which allows the particular wavelength uh, and the first filter allows a blue light though it is shown here in a different color, but it is a it has to be uh, wavelength between 450 to 490 nanometer light is allowed, but it could be different things, but this uh, here we are showing a particular arrangement which is now at this number 2 is beam splitter or dichroic mirror which is a beam splitting mirror reflects the light below 510 nanometer. So, it has it reflects the light below 510 nanometer, but allows the light above 510 nanometer to go through. So, the light is reflected and focused on to the object through objective lens and this could be you can say condenser as well as objective and then at as it is focused on to the object the excitation uh, ex, uh, this uh, uh, object is excited and emits a longer wavelength or fluorescence and that fluorescent wavelength passes through the dichroic mirror without any problem and then it passes through this filter which is the second barrier filter and allows only a specific green fluorescent emission between 520 and 560 nanometer to pass through and so, unwanted signals are cut in here and then you can either observe it through eyepiece or it could be uh, recorded. So, this is a typical epi, uh, optics of uh, epifluorescence microscope where like I said observation and emission is recorded from above actually. Uh, so, uh, uh, optics of epifluorescence microscope is different from a simple uh, schematic diagram which I have shown you earlier. All right. So, let us move on uh, to uh, understand this whole thing. Now, because very few cell components now problem with fluorescence is that uh, most of the cell components of biological samples are not fluorescent. Like for example, there could be a, like uh, in uh, proteins certain amino acids could be fluorescent or certain other like uh, pigments could be fluorescent, but not many of the uh, uh, biological samples are fluorescent. 
Now, because very few cell components are fluorescent here and even lesser can be excited by shorter wavelengths, the you have to use extrinsic uh, fluorophores or you have to attach dyes or other fluorophores and uh, they have to be bound to the particular cell component in order to visualize those cell components. Uh, so, this is uh, uh, requires a specimen preparation here, so that you can attach or you can bind those extrinsic fluorophores uh, and uh, you can observe the fluorescence. Now, four very useful dyes which are utilized uh, for fluorescent staining are one is rhodamine and Texas red which emit red light and when excited with green and yellow light. So, uh, rhodamine and Texas uh, red emits red light. There are others like uh, psi 3 emits orange light and fluorescein emits green light when excited with blue light. Now, most fluorescent dyes emit visible light, but some like psi 5 or psi 7 could be emitting infrared light also. We are not going into that. Now, there could be lot of other fluors which are used like for example, acridine orange, quinacrine they are used for lot of uh, 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 analysis of DNA samples or RNA samples or we can say nucleic acids. There could be other techniques also like in immunofluorescence microscopy, specific proteins or other molecules can be revealed in the specimen by chemically coupling these dyes to purified antibodies specific for a particular macromolecule. So, antibodies binds to this and since there is a dye attached to them, the fluorescence could lead to the localization or viewing of those particular macromolecules or structures. So, this is immunofluorescence as you are utilizing the antibodies in this case. Now, fluorescence microscopy can also be applied to live cells. It could be you can stain the cells or live cells directly could be seen through fluorescent microscopy. For example, uh, purified actin may be chemically linked to a fluorescent dye and it could be micro injected into cultured cells. The endogenous cellular and injected tagged actin monomer copolymerizes into long actin fibers and you can observe those arrangements uh, in vivo or as they are going on. Technique is very useful uh, uh, to study individual microtubule within cells. So, you can even you can utilize it for live cells. Uh, 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 fluorescence microscopy ha has been used for determination of intracellular concentration of say for example, calcium and H plus ions. Now, this is done like for example, for calcium ions the fluorescence properties of a dye called Fura 2 has been used. What it does is it facilitates the measurement of concentration of free calcium in cytosol. The fluorescence of Fura 2 at one particular wavelength is enhanced when calcium is bound and fluorescence is proportional to calcium. At another wavelength the fluorescence of this dye is same. So, whether or not calcium is bound or not by examining cells continuously uh, at two wavelengths you can determine the uh, quantify the concentration of the cytosolic calcium. Likewise, there could be other dyes which could be used for other ions like H plus or to determine pH. So, there could be lot of different ways fluorescence uh, could be used to uh, in fluorescence microscopy. Uh, another very important technique has been developed to detect specific proteins within living cells uh, as they are going or lo locating them at, at as a function of time. Now, what is done is there is a green fluorescent protein. This is a natural fluorescent protein and found in jellyfish and the bioluminescence of this organisms which radiates a green fluorescence is due to the green fluorescent protein. It is a 238 amino acid protein containing serine, tyrosine and glycine residues whose side chains have spontaneously reacted with another to form fluorescent chromophore. Now, by recombinant DNA technique, the GFP gene can be introduced into the living cultured cells either fused or otherwise and the expression of GFP proteins fused with other protein could be utilized for location of a protein in vivo. Uh, 
So, this is a very good technique to uh, detect specific proteins within living cells with the help of a green fluorescent protein. Uh, Let us discuss some of the uh, important applications of this particular technique. Now, what for fluorescence microscopy is mainly used? One is to visualize components which are difficult to see, uh, then to localize substances by means of a specific binding and to determine orientation by means of fluorescence polarization. We have already discussed about polarization, but if you know uh, we will discuss this how fluorescence polarization could be utilized. So, when you uh, many components which are in very low quantity can be visualized by fluorescence microscopy and like I said if you tag it with fluorescent compound a particular macromolecule could be located and followed uh, by observing its fluorescence uh, as a function of time. Let us take some examples of application of fluorescence microscopy. One is visualization of nucleic acids in animal and plant cells. Now, acrid in orange one of the dyes binds to both DNA and RNA, but gives a green fluorescence with DNA and if dye concentration is high it will give an orange fluorescence with RNA. Now, eukaryotic cells will exhibit a bright green nucleus and pale green cytoplasm at low concentration of dye, but at high concentration the cytoplasm will also become orange that is RNA will be also showing the fluorescence. So, during mitosis chromosomes glow bright green and could be observed in living cells for their morphological characteristics. Likewise, a cell which could be infected with DNA virus can be detected. Uh, so, you can detect the, the uh, DNA of virus as the green spots in cytoplasm rather than nucleus. So, this is a clear indication that DNA virus uh, or a virus has infected a particular cell. Uh, another could be visualization of small organelles. For example, the yeast nucleus was hard to see because of small size, but with the help of acrid in orange uh, uh, the, the DNA or the nucleus could be localized or nucleus could be seen actually here. And here uh, since the yeast has a large RNA to DNA ratio and uh, that is why it was very hard to see the uh, nucleus uh, till late time actually, but with the this particular technique it was able to uh, scientists were able to do that. Another application could be through fluorescent antibody technique like I told you earlier fluorescent dyes covalently coupled to antibody uh, can be used to localize specific substances in a sample. Now, cell components, viral antigens, histones and many other substances uh, for that matter could be localized uh, in individual cells or tissues and uh, it could be uh, followed also. The protein actin and myosin in muscle fibers were distinguished by fluorescent labeling labeled anti actin and anti myosin antibodies. So, uh, like immunofluorescence could be a very useful uh, way uh, for application uh, of uh, in various areas. Uh, another important application could be by utilizing polarization fluorescence microscopy that is you would like to know the orientation. Now, angle of polarization of the fluorescence with respect to DNA helix axis could be deciphered if you know the plane of polarization of a fluorescent dye. For example, if you know the plane of polarization of acrid in orange which intercalates between DNA base pairs, then you will be able to know the orientation of DNA helix as well. And this has been uh, used for uh, to find the orientation of DNA molecule with respect to chromosomes actually here. So, this is one very good technique uh, to polarization fluorescence could be a very good technique to uh, know the orientation of a macromolecule in a particular complex structure actually. So, as we have seen in uh, fluorescence microscopy that you could utilize it for detecting very small uh, uh, amount of components. It is a very sensitive method and gives a very good contrast. It is it can be used for both live cells as well as for uh, like stained cells and uh, 
in live cells you can detect small amount of material, you can follow it like we have seen through immunofluorescence or GFP binding and other techniques could be utilized for that purpose. So, you have lot of applications of confocal microscopy. The important part in the optics of uh, sorry fluorescence microscopy, the important part in fluorescence microscopy is that uh, you can uh, in optics of microscopy is that uh, you have to use optical filters and so that particular excitation wavelength and emission wavelength could be separated and you can detect the material. Uh, most of the uh, or you can say modern fluorescence microscopes are epifluorescence microscopes where the observation is from above and excitation is also from above. So, this was about fluorescence microscopy. Let us discuss another technique which is an extension of fluorescence optics, it is confocal microscopy. Now, confocal microscopy also utilizes the fluorescent optics like I said. Uh, here, uh, but there are certain differences between confocal microscopy and the fluorescence microscopy. In confocal microscopy, you can even use thick cells or uh, thick tissues or what we say uh, tissues and thick specimens. And this could give you a three dimensional image where the relative positions of different components can be visualized or could be observed. Now, here in confocal microscopy is usually used with uh, uh, lasers like we will discuss here in optics. Now, instead of instead of illuminating whole specimen at once as in conventional fluorescence microscopy we have seen, confocal microscope uses point illumination uh, that is you will illuminate a particular point in the specimen and a pinhole in an optical conjugate plane in front of the detector is placed to eliminate, eliminate uh, is placed to eliminate out of focus signals. So, what you have is the, the excitation wavelength which is coming out of one pinhole is in same focal depth as the pinhole in front of the detector. So, they are called confocal and another part which is in focus uh, same focal depth is the point on specimen. So, almost three points are here in the same focus. Now, the optical system focuses the spot of light on a particular focal plane in the sample. Now, supposing if you would like to make a three dimensional image of certain uh, object or sample say a tissue, then you have to make lot of optical sections, you have to make thin sections of that particular one and you have to uh, take the images of each section and later on you have to combine those sections, each of the image section, uh, images of from different optical section uh, to, uh, to build a three dimensional image. But here in confocal microscope, you can do that in the same tissue without sectioning. What you have to do is that you have to rather focus the light at different points uh, like you are rastering uh, it over or you are scanning the whole specimen in a rectangular fashion and at various depths. Now, this particular technique requires a bright source of illumination that focuses on a particular focal plane on the specimen. Uh, we will come to the optics in a little while, but the fluorescence emitted from the sample is collected and brought at an image suitable uh, uh, light detector. So, what is done here if you see uh, uh, the technique enables the reconstruction of three dimensional image by uh, scanning the sample over a rack regular raster which we call rectangular pattern of parallel scanning lights. The technique allows a high optical resolution and contrast as compared to conventional techniques and also thick samples could be scanned at different depths to obtain images and these all the optical images like I told you uh, like optical sections you can say which you are not really making a section could be combined to re reveal relative positions of components in three dimension. Let us see the optics of uh, schematic of optics of confocal microscope. Now, if you can see here, uh, 
there is a illuminating aperture through which the lasers are pointed at the dichroic mirror that is the beam splitter as we have seen earlier. Now, here lasers are required because it requires high intensity uh, and focus. So, these lasers are then through objective lens are focused onto the specimen. Now, difference is here is rather than focusing uh, or illuminating the whole specimen, it is focused onto a particular point in the specimen and there it goes like it scans uh, in uh, rectangular fashion at a different depths uh, and you have lot of images generated. Now, here like when it is at a particular uh, focal depth or focal point, then light which, uh, which or fluorescence which is uh, emitted from here and as it goes through the objective lens it allowed to pass through detector. Like I earlier we have already discussed about this that it will allow the particular wavelengths to pass through. So, one in focus with the detector, the point source and the point at the specimen, the light emitted from there or fluorescence emitted from there will pass through this particular aperture which is confocal detector aperture and the out of focus lights will not be allowed to pass through. So, what you get is at a time you get an image which is in focus and then to change the focus like to to raster or to go to different depths, you will change the focus of both these points in here and subsequently the focal point on the specimen will also change and you will collect lot of optical images which could be combined to give a three dimensional image. So, this is a very simple schematic of confocal microscope and it is like epifluorescence microscope, the difference that laser is being used and it is these two points are in focus uh, with each other that is they are confocal. So, uh, this was about confocal microscope and confocal microscope as we have seen is uh, uh, you can say could be utilized for thick specimens and it could be utilized uh, to generate three dimensional images. Now, before uh, let us uh, before we end this section, let us also discuss about little bit about specimen preparation for light microscopy. Now, if you could remember we have told I have told you that uh, there could be two kinds of samples uh, can be used here. One is you can use stained cells, but staining kills the cell and lot of processing is required where many times the internal architecture could be disturbed but uh, you try to retain that architecture through different uh, ways or different processing steps like we will discuss here. Another was live cells where you can utilize the cells as they are uh, and you have to have thin layer of cells or a single cell could be utilized uh, could be uh, used as a specimen to see in vivo phenomena or activities as they are going on. All right. Most of the microscopy techniques which we have discussed other than bright field microscopy, they utilize the they could be unstained samples, but still you have to prepare the samples which could be unstained, but they should be like uh, you have to prepare uh, sections of the specimen to be uh, visualized that is thin sections of the specimen has to be made for visualizing. Of course, you can use simple uh, thin layer of cells or live cells could be utilized, but still preparation of sample is required in lot of cases. Uh, so, uh, and like we have uh, in bright field microscopy, certainly you have to stain the cells because you will not be able to see uh, the, uh, the specimen without staining. So, let us see how the specimen preparation for light microscopy is done and very brief we are going to discuss this here. Now, specimen could be uh, whole mount or there could be sections actually. Now, many times specimen could be opaque also. Now, if there is an opaque object then light will not pass through it and you will not be able to observe anything. So, opaque objects needs to be made translucent by substituting water with alcohol and immersing object in solvents such as toluene or xylene in which they become clear. So, that has to be done if there are opaque object. Now, 
the specimen preparation, uh, the steps involved in specimen preparation are fixation, dehydration, embedding, sectioning and finally, staining if required. So, let us see each of these steps. Now, fixation specimens are generally fixed uh, with solutions containing alcohol or formaldehyde or acetic acid. Now, what is the role of this? What these compounds do is they denature most proteins and other macromolecules and formaldehyde uh, cross links also amino groups to adjacent molecules. Now, when this cross linking occurs, it stabilizes the uh, protein protein and protein nucleic acid interaction and eventually renders molecules uh, insoluble and stable for further procedures. So, what you have done is you have tried to uh, uh, tried that the internal ar arrangement is not disturbed. Somehow you have tried to uh, tried that the internal arrangement through cross linking could be preserved here. All right. Once fixation has been done, then dehydration has to be done. In dehydration, you have to remove the water. So, after fixation, tissue is dehydrated by series of transfers through alcohol water solutions. Now, the alcohol water solutions to pure alcohol and finally, a solvent like xylene. So, what happens? You have removed water and now it is like you have completely dehydrated the sample. Once you have dehydrated, the next step involves hardening of the sample to make sections by placing the sample in warm liquid paraffin or a plastic. So, what, what is done is in a, in a tube or a plastic tube, warm paraffin is taken and cell, uh, the, the, your sample is put in there. Now, as uh, they uh, cool down, the warm liquid paraffin will solidify and so the sample will solidify. So, it is like it's, this process is called embedding. So, after embedding, once you have embedded the samples in, uh, then a piece of specimen will be mounted on the arm of a microtome. What is a microtome? Microtome uh, is, uh, uh, is utilized is for sectioning thin section to obtain thin sections of the specimen. I will show you how it works actually. The arms moves up and down and over a metal or glass blade cutting sections of a very uh, thin sections of a few microns which is micrometer uh, around 1 to 10 micrometer thick sections are cut. Now, alternatively since uh, there could be another method where you do not want to process do so much of processing could be froze, uh, freezing the samples and then sectioning them, but you require uh, special uh, uh, instrumentation for that uh, to be used in uh, cold conditions. So, we are not going into that, but that is also a very useful technique. Now, this figure shows in here a microtome. So, microtome has it is a microtome arm and it, this microtome arm if you can see here a specimen which is a embedded specimen in paraffin or bags which is hardened is put in here and this microtome arm is moved up and down rapidly and which moves through uh, this glass blade or metal blade and there is a trough water trough here where these sections fall and these are sections like I said they would be around uh, what you call uh, uh, 1 to 10 micrometer sections here. Now, these sections could be mounted, they could be observed under microscope if staining is not required directly or they could be mounted after staining. So, uh, this is how the uh, microtome is utilized uh, for sectioning or making optical sections of the specimen. Remember, in as we will discuss later on electron microscopy, the there will be an ultra microtome, it will be similar, but uh, there are much thinner sections are required in electron microscopy that we will discuss later on. All right. Now, supposing if a staining has to be done, then what are different methods and what are different dyes to be uh, are utilized for staining. There are many chemical stains or we say dyes are available uh, for staining procedures. Now, these chemical stains will bind to molecules with specific features and they could be uh, specifically or differentially binding to different molecules, so that you can uh, 
differentiate them. For example, hematoxylene binds to basic amino acids like lysine and arginine on many different kinds of proteins, whereas eosine binds to acidic molecules like nucleic acids, aspartate or glutamic side chains. So, these are aspartic and glutamic side chains are acidic in nature, whereas lysine and arginine are basic in nature. So, one binds to basic residues, another binds to uh, acidic residues. Now, because of this differential binding properties, these dyes stains various cells to uh, uh, or and components of the cells differentially, so that you can distinguish them visually. There are many other dyes which are utilized. They could be like uh, two other common dyes, benzidine is utilized which binds to heme containing proteins and uh, there is fusion which binds to nucleic acids uh, or DNA and it could be used in different stains. Uh, other dyes could be malachite green, Sudan black, Kamasi blue and they have a specific uh, specificity for particular uh, components which could be subcellular components or macromolecules. Uh, I think all of you must have heard about Gram stain, which is uh, uh, has been developed by Christian Gram and it is had been used for differentiating, differentiating two large groups of bacteria, which is Gram positive bacteria, which stains and Gram negative bacteria, which does not, which does not stain. So, uh, there are a whole lot of different kinds of uh, uh, staining dyes are available uh, and which binds specifically. There could also be cytochemical staining. In cytochemical staining, it could be employed for detecting an enzyme in cell sections of an, uh, if an enzyme catalyzes a reaction that produces a colored visible precipitate from a colorless precursor. So, cytochemical staining could be utilized uh, and uh, to, uh, to uh, visualize uh, a certain sample actually. Uh, likewise, antibodies could be utilized. Uh, so, lot of different methods are available for staining the samples for bright field microscopy and other microscopy techniques. So, this completes our uh, section on light microscopy and in this section we have discussed uh, all different light microscopy techniques right from bright field microscopy to dark field microscopy, phase contrast microscopy, uh, differential interference contrast microscopy, fluorescence microscopy, polarization microscopy, confocal microscopy. And these techniques, if they, they have different uh, applications, but mainly they are utilized for viewing different kinds of samples. Like you have seen that dark field microscopy gives you limited resolution, but gives you excellent contrast. Phase contrast microscopy a valuable technique for visualizing lot of different cell components, subcellular organelles, macromolecular assemblies and so on. And it is widely used technique for uh, uh, even uh, recording or even visualizing the phenomenon as it is going on in real time in the cell. Uh, like for example, the movement of mitochondria or other different phenomena. Uh, differential interference contrast microscopy, where you could uh, uh, get rid of those diffraction halos uh, as we were seen in phase contrast and a pseudo three dimensional quality could be obtained. In polarization microscopy, certain amount, certain structures which are arranged in a particular fashion, which could be uh, parallel bundles or stacked disks they could be uh, utilized uh, for uh, giving you certain patterns through polarizer and analyzer uses uh, and you can visualize lot of different images which are very hard to see with other microscopy techniques. Likewise, fluorescence microscopy utilizes and confocal microscopy utilizes the fluorescence phenomenon and in confocal microscopy even you can use thick sections or tissues and three dimensional view could be obtained by combining lot of different optical section images from lot of different optical sections and uh, uh, a very useful technique for different application. So, I hope you have been able to understand uh, 
the different microscopy techniques, light microscopy techniques and would benefit from it. Thank you.